It is the return of the official Catch Up podcast. I am your host, Ben Grant. I'm joined by my colleague, as ever, Mr. Chris Pow. How are you doing, Chris? What's happening? Yeah, good, good. Uh, a lot to cover, obviously, because we've been off for, for so long. A lot of changes, uh, even in the world over the last you know, time we were on, obviously, you became a father, Ben. How's, how's things going there? Yeah, I was. At, the reason we weren't podcasting for the last four weeks, as Chris said, I have become a dad, and I was technically on paternity leave from the podcast. Chris is a good <laughs> boss, and he allows me to have some paternity leave. So, yeah, it's all good. We're having a great time. Uh, I've, uh, my daughter Libby was born on the 6th of October, so I've been um, getting well used to the... Um, the, the days and nights that comes of having a newborn child, but it's been great. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I go back to work tomorrow. Uh, this is Sunday as we're recording. I start a new job on Monday morning, so that's um, I don't do anything by halves at the moment. Um, new baby, new job. I um, don't know what the third new thing is going to be, but certainly, <laughs> um, yeah, keep myself busy. I haven't missed any football. I must admit, I've managed to see uh, all the football and I'm not going to lie, I've been enjoying my football since uh, for the last um, six, seven, eight, nine, ten weeks. Uh, I'm sure we'll cover off Cole and Rangers at some point, but the good times are back uh, for us, I would say, and we're having a good time. So there's also a lot to talk about within the um, tiers of football we cover, the tiers five, six, seven, eight, and nine across the, the Lowland League um, territory, region, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's the there'll be plenty to talk about, but we'll we'll start where we always start the Lowland League. Um, that's probably our bread and butter for the podcast. Um, I guess a lot been happening, Chris, in the, in the Lowland League. Um, we'll just kind of quickly run through where things are at. East Kilbride still sit top of the table um, as they have done for the majority of the season. Cumbernauld Colts keeping pace, um, although they have played a few more games in hand, but certainly still up there um, at the moment in second place. Hearts. Uh, B in third, Trinidad fourth, Bonesh United in fifth, Lonethco Rose sixth, Broomhill seventh, Civil Service Strolls eighth, Gallifrey Dean Rovers ninth, Celtic B tenth, Cowden Beath eleventh, Cali Braves twelfth, Stirling Uni thirteenth, Berwick fourteenth, Albion Rovers fifteenth, East Stirlingshire sixteenth, Gretna seventeenth, and Edinburgh Uni bottom of the table. Well, Chris, where should we start? We just go straight in and start at the top, East School Bride. Um, yeah, since I did watch the, the game against Braves yesterday, so um, interesting one. You, you watched the game, or okay? Mm-hmm. So you got to see um, the the free flowing uh, possession based football that EK um, are playing at the moment. How did they look? <laughs> yeah, free flowing, brilliant, brilliant football, but um, a lot of time, no end product. I think East School Bride are on a wee bit of a uh, a patch at the moment. Um, obviously, a lot of people know they got beat 7 0 off a Trinent in the Scottish Cup. A lot of overjoyed people on Twitter, I noticed. Uh, that, that it's never been, it's never easy being the, the top dog when people are gunning for you, but certainly that's what he's called Pride are. But, you know, Mick had mentioned that um, he felt he saw it coming. And I think he, I think it's true because if you look at the, the results against Berwick, I think they, you know, they just got past Berwick. They got past Alan Lufko's side that's been struggling with injuries and and suspensions. And yeah, they're not as free flowing as we we saw earlier in the season where they were, you know, really really on form. But um, I think they were lucky against the Braves. I must admit. Um, I don't know if you saw the the goal or no goal uh, effort uh, for the Have Braves. It. It looked to me at the time it looked over the line, uh, but it happened so fast. I hit the underside of the bar and uh, came back out. So it's like I don't know if the ref could have given it, but Braves were really good uh, yesterday. I think the the biggest change that I saw in East Kilbride, um they went one 0 down early into the second half, and uh, Nathan Flanagan got switched from the the left flank to the right, and that's when uh, EK started to cook because Nathan Flanagan, I think, has been their best player. Uh, this season, I think he's been the, their best signing. So, and to to kind of be the standout of that team, considering the quality of it, is uh, is says something about Nathan Flanagan being he's probably one of the the best players in the league. You know, but really smart move by Mick. I noticed he says, "I I, I do know what I'm doing sometimes." So, <laughs> yeah, he certainly did there because for the, the equaliser, Nathan's just you know cutting from the right, put on his left foot, and uh, put the ball away. And uh, he was part of the reason that. That EK got the penalty as well. I think he hit hit the ball straight at um, 
Jack McDowell, who had unfortunately had his hands up high, and uh, you know, that's a, a penalty for handball, and it's been put away. And East Kilbride, uh, I don't want to say they deserved the one because I thought it was quite an even game, but certainly their their quality shown through there, and I think that was this similar to the games against you know Berwick and Lafco. They, they've the sign of a good team. You don't necessarily play to your best, and you, you still get results. But um, I mean, and the, the the example of Berwick, obviously, we know that Berwick have somewhat been struggling lately because of the players that they've lost uh, for obviously the financial reasons. But I mean, the 1-0 uh, that uh, East Colbride got over, over Berwick was, um, it wasn't long after, you know, Hearts B put, I think, six, six past Berwick. So, I mean, you would have expected East Colbride to go down to Shieldfield and really, really put the heart in on. But as what is, uh, East Colbride top, um Look, they've been the best team in the league so far. I think it's safe to say, despite the the Scottish Cup result. And uh, but you know I, they've got a wee bit of a an edge at the moment um, because they aren't playing the, the greatest football that I've ever seen uh, compared to, as I say, compared to the start of the season when they're blown away teams. It's just not happening at the moment. But I think uh, Sai and uh, obviously mech are, are smart enough to to change things up, and we we saw that in the game against uh, Cali Braves. Cali Braves. As I say, I think they've been all right lately. They've had a few players in the team of the month, obviously. And uh, yeah, I think Braves have been all right. I think it's not shown in the position in the league. They've not really went up too too much, but certainly they're out of the, the relegation zone, which is which is good for them. Uh, but yeah, I think they'll be disappointed with the, the result yesterday. Yeah, I think I mean, we're talking about East School I mean, we've talked about their quality um, and depth in this podcast over the last two or three months now. Certainly, we know what they're capable of. We know they're, they're still unbeaten in the league. I think you mentioned the cup game. The, I know I know. Matt said they've seen it coming, but nobody could foresee a 7-0 defeat. No, I know. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't anything that anyone expected. We know Trinet are a good side. That's that's no, no doubt about that, that Trinet are a quality, quality Maybe not side. a 7-0, but I think a defeat yeah, might have absolutely. been clear. Yeah, yeah a, loss, <laughs> a loss was probably... Um, the tough thing for probably East Kilbride is that happened in the Scottish Cup, which then obviously that has a kind of knock on effect for the team. But I just kind of wonder maybe if, if you know, Mick Gill did take kind of an arrogance, maybe um, creeping into his team. And then I wonder maybe does that, did that maybe come from, I think, the Hamilton uh, game where they maybe went into that game thinking that, that Hamilton were beatable? Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm just surmising really about the situation because I think I looked at the, the Hamilton East Kilbride game in the in the SPFL um, Trust Trophy or it was called um, and I thought East Kilbride could take Hamilton um, I hadn't realised that, that Hamilton hadn't lost a game this season either so I uh, certainly thought maybe that maybe it's come from there and then obviously they said the great bye against the Lithgow Rose and they've obviously been absolutely thrashed by, by Trinent but the thing about East Kilbride is we know that we know their quality. They've got the games in hand, which um, I mean, points in the board are important. But you, you know, you've got a long season ahead. Games in hand will um, will be crucial uh, to to book to East Kilbride and um, I guess to enter a bit further off the pace. To East Kilbride, they've played one less game than the EK, and they're um, something like I think nine points behind East Kilbride at the moment. So. Uh, come on, Old and Hearts B have both played sixteen, so uh, plenty, plenty of football we played in, in this um, this league so far. The one thing we can, I think, worth talking about is Kilbride, and, and I'll probably get a bit of stack for this. But uh, you look at the signings that Kilbride have made, even in, in the short term, um, and what they can make, and probably what they can do in the next probably few months. I think I read somewhere um, in a group chat the other day that East Kilbride had. Made twenty six signings since Mick and Sai uh, came in during the summer. Uh, I, thought, I honestly thought it would have been more than that, to be honest. Yeah, so somebody <laughs> actually listed the full, um, the full, the, every single player. I think it was like twenty six was the was the number. So um, that's a that's a whole new squad of more. And then you look at that list on paper and you go like that. That the, the signs they've made are are, un, are unbelievable. There's, there hasn't been a lot of movement going out the door. I think that's the thing that stands out for me is that I understand they've obviously got some injury problems and things like that and that's probably why they've made the signings but certainly it's mad and East Coast Bay fans will probably get upset by saying this but obviously the money is very apparent now um, at East Coast Bride. 
they have the the facilities to go and buy or bring in top top when they signed what Joao Baldi from uh, Arbroath, Arbroath yeah, yeah. during the week um, straight from the championship and on loan um, I don't imagine Arbroath are giving him away for free for example so uh, he, they'll be having to pick up a, a good proportion of his wages I'd, I'd expect if not all of them uh, they have as you say loads of quality in that team and yeah I think EK will be fine I still don't have any concerns about East Kilbride as a team at the moment I think it's clear now that, that Mick can Sai know what they're doing. Like you said, they have an idea of how they want to play, and, and maybe that's maybe to their detriment. Perhaps at some points, they always want yeah. to play this certain way, and they they don't seem to maybe want to mix it up. To uh, if they get into a, a maybe a bit of a battle, a bit of a I guess a bit of a war of attrition. If you like, you probably against a team like Trent, who are a bit of a, a kind of hard working, tougher side rather than a the kind of style of football that the EK would play. It means that. It might be a bit more harder and they get into difficult situations, but East Coast Bank for me will be absolutely fine. In terms of Cali Braves, I think, um, yeah, doing well. I know it's a, what, we won three in a bounce up until a couple of weeks back and a, uh, we're four unbeaten going into yesterday's game. So, they, yeah, good form. The thing for a team like Cali Braves is staying out of that relegation spot. That's 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 their goal. Like, let's not kid ourselves on. That's what a team like the, like Cali Braves are. They're, they're Staying out of relegation and and just trying to do the, what they can and see if they can mount a challenge and maybe get a cup run to go. But yeah, Cali Bays are doing doing well and I think there's more to come from from them too. Yeah, I think there's definitely a partnership developing between Jack McDowell and Daniel Martins. The the knock on Daniel Martins has been that he's maybe not the best defender on the ball, but he's no 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 nonsense. He's kind of old fashioned type thing. You know, uh, John Guffrey's done really well. Seems to be playing all over the pitch for Cali Braves, a very, very sort of utility player, and he uh, probably doesn't get the credit he deserves for for being a bit of a stopper and a, a breaker down the possession sort of thing. But I think you're right on what you say about East Kilbride. Don't don't go too far into East Kilbride. They don't want to be the East Kilbride podcast, but um, yeah, I, you, it's funny because their goal came from a ball kind of over out wide to Nathan Flanagan and that's not exactly how they were playing that game. Uh, so they tried something different and it worked and you, you think to yourself, you know, you can be the best team in possession, but when you're out of possession and, you you know, you're not playing the way you want to, you're not controlling the tempo, I think that's when he's called Bright Struggle. And obviously when they played Trinant, you know, three goals, I think in the first 20 minutes, you, you're not, you can't train for that. You can't, you can't train for being a for being in that situation if you're East Kilbride because, I mean, it, I, I, I don't imagine they, they have too many sort of um, training sessions where, where they're, they're the underdogs, basically, you know what I mean, where they're, they're doing these defensive things and, and whatnot. Um, I would imagine that they, they train in a way that, that suits their style, but you've got to remember every game is different and sometimes you'll not get that, get that style that you want and... Uh, I think that's a warning for East Kilbride. One thing I will comment on because it, it, it comes up is um, just to finally round off East Kilbride. Today marks the seven years since East Kilbride beat Ajax's 44-year-long world record of consecutive wins. Uh, and every time I see that, I get a wee bit a wee bit jealous. And i tell you why. It's because I, Ajax gave them 27 crates of uh, Jupiler beer. And have you ever had Jupiler beer? It's a Belgian beer. Um, the best beer I've ever tasted. I'm not a massive drinker now, but I don't think it's available in the UK. Yeah, it might be now, but I remember the first time I ever had that. I was in Bruges with my my nana and my granddad, and I was uh, just sort of kicking about Bruges. And I I think the the drinking age there is like younger. I'm trying to remember who I was going out with. I don't know if that's a you know a, a concerning thing that I, I remember. How old I was by uh, who I was going out with, but um, I think I was fourteen or fifteen at the time, and I was at this kind of stall thing in Bruges, in the centre of Bruges. It was like a, it was like a stall slash chip van, but without the motor. And I, I'm just there at this thing myself, buying these these bottles of Jupiler or cans of Jupiler from this guy, just constantly for about, for half an hour or something. Uh, so I, I think the drinking age is like it's younger, it's like sixteen or something. But I just remember that just. Uh, it's the best beer I've ever tasted, I think. So if you can get your hands on Jupiler and you're a beer drinker, give it a try. But yeah, I always, I always get a wee bit jealous when I when I see that coming up, that they've got 27 crates of that stuff. It was brilliant. Brilliant. Maybe that's a clip for TikTok or something, that. Eh? How we digress from uh, East Kilbride 
to Jupiler <laughs> beer. I, three things you never <laughs> thought you would see in a football podcast uh, for non-league football in Scotland. I'll tell you that first <laughs> Never seen that coming. When he mentioned Ajax, I had absolutely no idea where he was going. And I was like, he's called Bride? Ajax? Um, <laughs> okay, fair enough. So It's on yeah. their Twitter anyway. Everyone there should know go. that. Very impressive. Um, he's called Bride. And, and I'd say how you managed to link up he's called Bride in, in Ajax. I never knew that was possible. So there we go. Moving on then down, uh, we'll go further down the, the table. Cumberland Colts, Chris, absolutely flying uh, at the moment, uh, you could say. Uh, I won one draw with, with Albion Rovers yesterday, certainly, but um, that's then, what, five un- five unbeaten? Uh, last time they lost was Broomhill uh, in the Scottish Cup back in September. So uh, Cumberland Colts started the season strongly. We talked to them. We thought they would probably fall away at some point. I think I'll be honest, I think I said that in a, in a few episodes back that that I don't think they'll keep pace, but certainly we're in November now, they're sitting second and they're, and they're doing all the right things, beating the teams they're supposed to be beating. Um, it's what I would say about about Cumberland and just going about their job probably quite quietly because EK probably grab all the headlines in, yep. in this league at the moment and Cumberland Colts just sitting there, just chilling. Um, probably a bit like uh, probably a bit like Spartans last season. We've, we've talked about Spartans. We didn't really talk about an awful lot about them to Till pretty yeah, much they yeah. got close to the end and, and they won the in the league. So uh yeah, Cumberland Colts very impressed with what they're doing uh, at the moment. They're, they're a strange one because um obviously Stephen O'Neill recently left their, their captain that had been there having since two thousand and fifteen, like they the whole time they competed in the lone league. I think the interesting thing about this, and I hope I'm not annoying anyone, but uh, obviously Stephen O'Neill played as a trialist for Albion Rovers against Cumberland Colts, so I think there was a few concerned faces if he, you know, if he was to, to get a go against against his former club or whatever. But um, he, he never, thankfully, for for Cumbernauld Colts. That would have been a, a tough one, obviously, and I don't know if he would have celebrated. But um, yes, it's, it's a weird one because um, it, they're really hard to work out because immediately, even before uh, Stephen O'Neill left, I thought you know, they're probably missing a centre mid uh, to make that team a truly really good side. Uh, I mean, but then you look at it and I mean, Graham Holmes isn't even starting for them. So it's like they've got one of the best keepers in the league in Ryan Adamson. They've got a goal scorer in Billy Mortimer. Um, a lot of the younger players, obviously, Cammy Dixon, your Keelan Adams, your Luke McCarvels, they're all stepping up and playing great. And, you know, David, <laughs> I think David Proctor has a good problem on his hands because I, I don't think he wants to change things because it seems to be working. You know what I mean? Um Craig Holmes has been fantastic lately as well. So it's like, do you change it up even though you've got guys like Graham Holmes and uh, before Stephen O'Neill sitting on the bench? I don't know. It's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, yeah, the players you expect to be starting, are, you know, can't get a look in. I think we mentioned, you know, previously Ashley Ballam, who's done well and he's he's not starting too. So, yeah, it's, it's a good problem to have for Colts. I think I've mentioned it before. But, yeah... Um, I don't know why why Stephen O'Neill left, but yeah, he certainly didn't seem like he was playing. So it's maybe just out of frustration out of, out of, out of that, basically, because he's always been their key man. Yeah, I think we, we're coming old. I think the the thing you think about there is if it's not broke, don't, don't fix it, really. Yeah, yeah. They were, as I said, they, they, they won five and or five unbeaten, granted, uh, or four four wins in the bounce, and then uh, a draw yesterday. Certainly. <laughs> Difficult for them to be to be like, oh, I'm going to change this up, and because um, I said the only the only time they've only lost two games in the last what ten get matches or something like that. So that's crazy. Doing, so doing brilliant, you know. Um, and you can probably go go deeper into the form. I'm only just looking at the, the kind of the last ten. But there's, there's probably um, a few more games there. The, the one we mentioned how they started the season pretty strongly, and yeah, it's difficult. And I think yeah. For, for David Proctor, it's, it's definitely a good problem we have in the, the sense of you've got a, you've got a full squad there to pick from, you've got talented players all over the pitch, and, and I think the other thing as well, if you've got them on the bench, they can come on and affect the game. If you are maybe having a bit of a struggle, I think you can you see that in a lot of teams that the depth maybe not quite there, and that's the that's probably why they're playing at this level because you don't have the teams that the players that can come on and, and change the game. Like we mentioned, these Cobain their squad, they've got a bench that's littered with. Um, 
players would walk into pretty much any team in the lowland league. You know, that's the way the way they're set up and uh Cumbernauld have that depth um at the moment. Obviously with if injuries do kick in for, for Cumberland Colts then it becomes a bit more of a problem. But certainly uh yeah, doing doing great. We've got the wins on the board, ten wins, three draws, three losses. It's it's a decent record. We definitely didn't have come on old Colts in the probably in no. the top six, seven, eight, maybe even top ten of the league at this po- in the start of the season when we spoke. We need to go back and check what we thought um of our predictions, but certainly we never had them sitting anywhere near the top of the table. So yeah, got like, a lot of respect for it uh, and, and doing good things. Next up, Hearts B. Uh again, st- started off pretty well. Sitting at the top, uh, lost to Stirling Uni, which is probably a bit of a shock given where Stirling Uni are at in their in their season with their squad and things like that, and maybe not the team that we that we know. Talking about Stirling Uni at the moment, uh, and our team who are like in a winning streak as well, so um, maybe getting onto a, a bit of a rhythm. But Hearts B, um, no secret, I, I know Chris, you had something to talk about when it comes to Hearts B. There was a bit of a, a comment that upset you in terms of um, B teams, I think. You were getting a wee bit upset about teams maybe playing weak sides or something, you know. I think that upset you a little bit on social media. <laughs> it didn't upset me, but I had to call it out because I, it wasn't true, uh, the points that were given. And it was in, um, John Miller, the, the assistant manager from the Loughborough Rose, who were uh, who drew 1-1 with Caden Beef, just to quickly cover that off. And uh, yeah, um, one thing I will say, though, is uh, wish us, uh, Greg Skinner a speedy recovery. He had a reported leg break uh during that game, and uh, ho- hopefully he's okay, and you know, um, you know, wish him a speedy recovery and everything. But yeah, it was a it was a strange comment. Um, I said I think it was one of frustration because they had just played Celtic uh, midweek, uh, and as I mentioned about the Lafco Rose, they had, uh, you know, uh, they've had a lot of injuries and a lot of suspensions. I think they've they've had a few sending offs uh, even since you know August. Uh, for, I think it's five, five or six, maybe. In the last wee while, so that ha- that ha- that has been a lot. Uh, but yeah, John Miller's comment. Um, the thing about Hearts B, you mentioned uh, the Hearts B side that played Stirling Uni. It, it was just the wrong information. Gordon heard the Long Lafco manager cleared that up and said that he, he saw the the under 18s lineup uh, who were playing the same day. It was just a, a mistake of the lineup because they, they obviously the the Twitter posts like the women's and the the youth lineup. Yeah. So it was just a mistake in that one. Well, he mentioned about Celtic, however, I mean, I'm guessing if you look at the team that played Edinburgh Uni yesterday uh, and the one that played the Rose midweek, it is a lot different. Um, obviously, Rocco Vat is not playing, Mackenzie Kearse isn't playing. But one thing I will say is the likes of Mackenzie Kearse and uh, Rocco Vata before they played the Lafco were on international duty, you know, with under, you know, Rob Hubbock of Ireland under 19s, of Scotland under 19s. So, whether they would have played the games before then, I'm not really sure. But uh, I think the only massive example I can find is um, Celtic were playing in the UEFA youth competitions and I think they had East Stollinger uh, and East Stollinger. They faced a really weakened Celtic side, I'm guessing because of the UEFA competition. But I don't think there's massive examples with Celtic. Certainly not with Hearts. Hearts have been a, a team that... I think I've been fairly consistent. The only example I can think is when Mackenzie Kirk was involved in the first team. So I don't, to me, I don't know if the argument really carries as much weight as it has. Uh, it did, sorry, the last couple of seasons when it was clear that it was going on, where Owen Moffat, for example, was out the Celtic side for two games, then they suddenly play Spartans, Owen Moffat and whoever else is back in the side. Yeah. You know, so. I'm not sure on John Miller's point. I, I, as I say, I think it's one out of frustration because of the way Lon Lufko have um, things have went for them recently. Um, you know, uh, and, and can be for it was a. I think it was more of a disappointing um, game in, in terms for Ken Beef because I I fully expected Ken Beef to to win that uh, and they didn't. They drew. Obviously, they they played each other recently in the cup and Ken Beef, um, you know, won uh, eventually. I think in extra time, but. Yeah, um, as for Hearts B, they have been flying. Um, going back to Hearts B there, Mackenzie Kirk has been scoring goals for fun. Uh, Sterling Uni done really well, you know, to, to keep them out. Uh, I think the only difference in that game was the penalty. Uh, Kieran McAkinch has, has put it away and gave them the win. Really good win for Sterling Uni against the Hearts B that's been flying. But in terms of the game, I don't think there was you know, much to talk about. 
Uh, I think two teams cancelling each other out. For the penalty, I did see the the uh, the incident, and it's very unclear to why the ref gave the penalty. There's there's two kind of things in the box where like it was two Hearts B players and two Sterling Uni players. So I don't know. I can't see the foul basically, but I don't I don't know. It's very hard to 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 see the foul and uh, because of the, there's like two comings together basically. Yeah? So um, it's probably in there somewhere. I'm I'm. Just from my point of view, I, I can't see the foul. So, but yeah, a good one for Stalin Uni, nonetheless. They've, they've uh, done really well, and we shout out to Jake Service as well, who's came back. He's a big player for Stalin Uni. I think he's been missing the last couple of weeks uh, through injury. So, yeah, Stalin Uni. I think Chris will be delighted to to get the win there on uh, Ainsley Park on Friday night. Yeah, they're a team that are, I would say that are see starting to build. I think they've got a couple of a few wins in the bounce now. Uh, three wins on the trot. That is. Uh, we know they had a slow start, but that that probably comes down to the new squad, the the, the turnover of players. They, they lost some some really capable players over the um the last over the summer. We, we've talked about it plenty on this podcast. You mentioned Kieran McIntyre. I think he's a great player. I've, I've seen him uh, in a preseason friendly. I thought he was really good. Watched him in the in the cup game as well against Albion Rovers, and I thought he was he's a really um very really decent um. Player for for um for Stirling Uni. You mentioned Jake Service. I've got a lot of time for Jake Service. I think I've seen him a couple of games now, and he's yeah he makes a big difference. I think to their, their defensive lineup as well, which probably may have been the difference. I think they're they've got the capable individuals, and it's it's one of those ones and just trying to fill those gaps. The guys that have that have essentially left, and, and that's what they're doing. And you're probably finding. It's maybe took a wee bit longer to, to gel and they're getting to that point now where they're, where they're gelling. There, there are two players that you mentioned there that have came on leaps and bounds since, you know, being in the league. Obviously, Kieran was formerly East Cobride. East and, Cobride, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing, amazing. And it's what you expect from Sterling Uni, obviously. I think we have to give a big shout out to the, the keeper as well, Jan, who I think there was a few doubts, obviously, because Ben Fry was such a solid keeper. Uh, Jan came into the team as first, first choice. A big step up, really. From being kind of back up to to Ben when he was there, but he's been fantastic, really good. Um, I think Ben McIver Redwood, another one that I've noticed, has he's he's a different player, yeah, compared to, to his previous years at uni in terms of um, his ability and his wee runs. I think Chris has obviously been a striker uh, himself. I mean, he I'm sure he works with that with you know the likes of Cammy McKinley and and Ben, but uh, yeah, um, still in uni, I think. They're probably one similar to Hearts B last season, where the 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 quality of that team is probably not shown so much in the the league state uh, standings so far. But I think they'll they'll push on now and and hopefully, you know, get to the top half or tenth, uh, which is their favourite position. Obviously, yeah, absolutely, yeah, not far away. They're sitting thirteenth just now. Uh, that, that's for sure. Just when you mentioned Cowden Beef, I um, obviously saw them a couple of weeks ago in the Scottish Cup against ourselves. Uh, we lost one 0 uh, to Cowden Beath in the Scottish Cup, as I say, uh, they, they scored with ten minutes to play with a, a pretty slack back pass from one of our players that got um, Mikey Cunningham in goal and, and, and got the goal. But I honestly thought Cowden Beath were bang average as a team. I didn't. I expected a lot more from Cowden Beath. They've got some good individual players. Um, I think um, Aidan McLaughlin stood out for me as a as a player, and uh, Robin McNabb looked really good um, in terms of individuals, but. I think as a team, didn't really see much. I mean, we weren't brilliant, I'm not going to lie, on, on the day, but I just don't think they were, they were that good. And I just felt, the other thing I felt about Cowboys as a club, and this is probably going to come back to haunt me, but I felt like we still had that arrogance of being a, a like a big club, you know, like they were, like the, which they were. They're not anymore. They're, they're only a couple of divisions between us and, and them now. And I just felt the whole, it was pretty poor. I just didn't really enjoy the, the experience that, that we had in the, in the cup game, we we put on some um, some good stuff and we treated them well, and they just didn't feel like it was a. I, I just felt yeah, there was something funny about how the whole the whole setup in Cowden Beath, and um, yeah, I didn't think there were any great shakes, and it doesn't shock me that um, they haven't. The only one they've had in the last four games is um, against us in the in the Scottish Cup, you know, so. Um, yeah, Cowden Beath got a lot of work to do. I think are they going to they're going to be that big club that they think they are. Uh, certainly, 
Yeah, it's de- yeah, like I mentioned, obviously, I thought it would be long enough ago. Um, and it is, a, it is disappointing to hear that because uh, the kind of fans that I speak to and uh, I've, I've seen their games and stuff, they are obviously a passionate bunch like every other football fan. So, yeah, disappointed to hear that. I've never really well, seen... I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there just on, on the fans. I thought they travelled in good numbers and good voice and they were... Um, I, th- I really... Do you think it was more from a player side is what you're trying to say? Um, just probably more, I would say, club side of things. I think oh, I right, don't okay. know specifically, like, player, like, specific. Right, okay. um, right. Just my, a club feeling. Um, it's what, the, the feeling I got off of um, the people I interacted with, certainly, uh, and certainly that was the kind of... You must get that, that from a few of the bigger junior clubs as well, because I've certainly seen that where, you know, yeah. No? Mm. I've not, certainly... not, per- not personally, because I think we're probably <laughs> we are probably at a big junior club in the, in the yeah. open stakes of junior football. So, um, and maybe maybe I go to clubs and I, and I act like that. I don't know, um, and yeah. I hope I don't. But um, I just felt it was a wee bit. I felt it was a bit off. I just that's it. for a big right. occasion, Scottish Cup tie. I just felt it was a bit off. We were playing the same park and the same competition, the same round, and, and there just was a, a whiff of. Um, just a whiff of arrogance I didn't really I didn't really like. But yeah, the other thing as well, they beat us one 0 as I say, with a scrappy um gift of a goal and they celebrated like they'd beaten fucking Rangers. Like <laughs> do you know what I mean? It was like jumping about and uh, running to get photographs with the, all the fans and I get they travelled and all that, but I was like we were the underdogs in that game. I think the bookies had us something like five to one or something like that, six to one to one. Um and for me, it wasn't that that wide of a gap when it comes to the odds, you know. But there's obviously two leagues below. There's two leagues below at the moment. Uh, but the gap in terms of football and the ability wasn't wasn't there at well, all. Was, yeah. um, and that's what these teams are going to are probably forgetting that that the likes of West Prem, West First Division teams, East Prem teams, some maybe East um, East First teams are, are are not a million miles away from. Um, from the likes of Cowdenbeath, and uh, we've got Albion Rovers in a few weeks uh, in the South Challenge Cup, so it'll be interesting to see what they're like um, uh, in, the, in that competition, but the, the thing will be is that I think I made a comment on uh, Pine Bovel the other week, I dipped my toe back in there for a few weeks back, oh, and <laughs> um, yeah, I know, I was I was in a, a kind of, I'll blame, I'll blame being on pretending even having maybe a little bit too much time in my hands between feeding and things like that, that I, can, I was reading Pie and Bob when I saw a few comments about Cowden Beef and, and I made a comment about them being like the type of club that are kind of the gatekeepers of uh, the Lowland League and the fact that we don't have the ventilation that we always want. And that's probably why, because you probably look at a match like that and go like that, or Cowden and versus Cowden Beef, not that far apart. We don't want these teams coming up and ruining our Lowland League. Um, and that's probably the reason why these teams are voting um, against having increase relegation promotion to protect themselves the absolute self-preservation that we always talk about but um the gap between i say low and league sides premier league teams and first division teams are it's not it's not a million miles away and, and that's was very very apparent on uh, last saturday moving on then we will cover off a couple more teams we're not going to go through the whole we won't, uh, we won't have another month break or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. Be that, time to talk. The, yeah. the catch up is back. We're basically just <laughs> catching up the catch up, as the saying goes, uh, and we'll be back to normality on. We I'll record on Sundays or Mondays, and we and we get out for you as quick as we can. But um, I guess you want to talk about Chris Berwick, uh, new management team in place there. Yeah, obviously Stuart Malcolm left to uh, to join our bro, uh, Dick Campbell. I mean, you would jump at the chance to work with Dick Campbell. I've I've spoken to him. I spoke to him uh, during the like the Kelly playoff game years ago, and he's such a character, Dick. He knows his football. We, even just having a, I think I was sitting sitting beside him for a half, and we were. He was just. Oh, I'm right. I'm talking right beside him almost. Eh? So we're just chatting football, and that uh, Dick's Dick's such a character, and certainly knows his stuff. And you know, I I think it would have been a hard decision for Stuart to to leave Berwick because you, you know that he's got his. Um, I think he felt a lot, a lot of passion for that club, but um, I, I certainly got that, you know, with a statement when he left. But yeah, to work with Dick Campbell, um, who I believe, I think he was a player of Dick's as well. So it's like, yeah, you, you have to jump at that chance. And yeah, Tam Scobie took over his first management gig. Um, I know Tam from 
from Kelty and uh, really happy for him to to take over there. And I believe um, his first game in charge, obviously, 2-2 against Trenent. I heard Trenent might have got away with one there. Uh, Berwick were leading for the longest time, 2-0. And, you know, Trenent get the equaliser late on. And then I believe... um, it looked like they were out of it from what I heard. I saw on Twitter someone left it 2-0 because he was that confident that Berwick were going to get the win and he's he's at the, he's at the park and uh, it's suddenly 2-2 or whatever, you know, that old that old football cliche. So. Um, but yeah, there was there was a lot of uh, unhappiness, I would say, about um, the the amount of time the ref played on, which allowed Trinent to, to, to get the equaliser, you know, the last kick of the the ball. Um, it's a massive point for Trent from a losing position. Yeah, for Berwick, it's, it'll be disappointing not to get the win because obviously, from all accounts, it seemed like they certainly deserved the win, but they're coming up against a really good Trent side. Tam Scobie will be interesting. I know he's always been keen on coaching and management, so uh, hopefully he can do something with Berwick. We obviously know what the the predicament is there. We're having lost a few players. Um, obviously, not the, not the same players that were initially... Uh, you know, uh, on the, you know, we need these guys out of the club sort of thing. Uh, they have managed to keep, you know, like Sakala Mantel, for example. So um, there, there are still bits and bobs there uh, for, for Berwick to work with, but I'm not really expecting too much of them. Berwick sitting currently in 14th uh, position in the table. We'll look at the bottom um, of the Lone League at the moment. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, I've been overset. 15th and 15 points, East Allenshire on 13 points, Grena on 6 points, and Edinburgh Uni on 4. Uh, Edinburgh Uni got their first one of the season against Gretna. Um, it was 3 2. Uh, Gretna already had a win the board, so they had some points on the board. The, the gap obviously been quite close, but Gretna uh, getting a, a fantastic result on. Uh, Saturday against uh, Broomhill. I, I mean, a very good Broomhill side. I think they, they, they come off a, a win against uh, B last week in the, the Scottish Cup. And we know how, how good B are. We don't need to go any mega detail about them and for them to get a result against a team that were unbeaten in God knows how long. Uh, by that point, uh, for getting to then turn up and uh, take on Broomhill uh, at Radio Park and, and getting a, a win and a clean sheet, I think, for getting a uh, yeah, very impressive. Well, they could have crumbled. Uh, we often talk about you know the how important the the games are between the the bottom two sides, Edinburgh Uni and uh, Gretna currently. But they could have crumbled after that, and the heads could have went down after losing to Edinburgh Uni, and kind of oh, that was our, our best chance to get out of this position. But they've came back and got a fantastic result against uh, a Broomhill team that are, are really solid on their day as well. You know. Um, I don't think there was much to the game from what, from what I saw Mike post. I think it was one that it's probably maybe hard on the eyes for the Broomhill fans, you know. Um, not much moments of quality, but one guy we'll talk about is obviously Ian Anderson. He seems to be scoring goals for Gretna now, and it's it's one thing you need if you're a, you know fighting for your lives, a, a goal scorer. Uh, but for me, the the I'm really happy for. For Gills, uh, Brian Gilfill and the, the Gretna manager, he looked overjoyed at the win. And um, I, for me, it's been coming. I think we mentioned that they have been playing a lot better. And hopefully, they, they just don't rely on this one win. And hopefully, they you know they can get a few more results under their belts. As the Germans say, we're stagging out. That means uh, we're going up, and uh, hopefully, they stay up basically. Uh, but Edinburgh Uni, more concerning for them now, isn't it? They're they're. Forgetting I have been bottom of the league for for the longest time now they're they're, they're out of that position and uh, they'll they'll be hoping to to stay out there now it's up to Edinburgh Uni to, to bounce back and and try and get themselves out of that uh, predicament. Yeah, if, if, from from Gretna's perspective, I think they have to go in some sort of run or they have to go and try and get yep. um, some sort of form in, in place to to pull themselves out there. We we I think we mentioned it back in back in August when they beat Seville two uh, one. They really got to go and build on that. They then went on a what's that a nine game losing streak uh, until yeah. Saturday there. So I think I think yeah, it's all great getting the win. You got to we got to applaud the victory on the day. As I say, Broomhill are are, are no mugs and are, are a good side and are in the top half of this division for a reason. So yeah, they just have to go now and uh, get get some wins on the board. They've got um, Stirling Uni coming up and then it's any kind of 
Hearts B, Linlithgow Rose, Bonus, East Cobain. So not an easy run of fixtures coming up for Gretna. Uh, but if they can perhaps get something out of Stirling Uni, because uh, we've talked with them, obviously, already. They're not the same side of the way. Um, so they, they might be able to get some sort of result, perhaps. But, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they, how that plays out uh, for, for Gretna, just to, to try and get a gap, because there is a gap now between them, them and East Stirlingshire. Uh, it looks like a... I expect a, a two horse race at the bottom, and a, and like you say, the, the critical games are going to be those ones between each side. And and um, uh, Edinburgh Uni have got come out on top in the last game, so uh, certainly would think that it's it's going to be crucial for for the future ones between the two sides. That pretty much covers off uh, the low and league. Uh, we'll move on to some of the other uh, divisions or leagues that we talk about across uh, the football pyramid and we'll jump across to the east of Scotland and just look and see what's happening over there. Broxburn still sitting top of the table uh, on 34 points and uh, a, a bit of a gap now in uh, forming. Uh, we were kind of talking about how it was quite wide open Chris, in the league um, the last time we had a podcast, certainly. Uh, Gene Fields sitting second on 26 points with two games in hand. Uh, Musselburgh also on um, 26 points in third. And then Socky on 25. So, um, yeah, we bit of a gap. Obviously, a couple of games in hand for, for Gene Field. Uh, down at the bottom, Lancarty, Glenrothes and Canoe all um, sit in the relegation spots with Inver Keith and Hillfield Swift sitting just above them. Uh, five points clear uh, of Lancarty, who've got a couple of games in hand. But, Brock Spawn sitting top, Chris, look good for their um, top of the table position at the moment. They've, they've been very impressive, Brock Spawn. Got, you know, uh, got to say Robert Watt, who moved from Pennycook to, uh, to Brock Spawn, has been a, fun, you know, a fantastic signing. He's, he's you know, kept a lot of clean sheets for them. He's a, he's, you know, a top quality keeper in that league. And uh, yeah, I often see Bob Watt, you know, clean sheet, clean sheet, and I've seen it more often. So um, yeah, Brock Spawn, I've been a... a, a you know they've always been a kind of there are thereabouts team, but I, I would not have expected them to be the the top team. We often talk maybe maybe uh, unfairly, probably. You know we often maybe look at Genefield, we look at Musselburgh, uh, perhaps even Socky, who I must say have been on a somewhat of a resurgence lately. Yep, uh, absolutely. They, they got beat four one off of Genefield uh, yesterday, which is obviously going to be disappointing. But Jean, uh, but fair play to Socky, they've they've came back somehow. After a really poor start, but um, I think uh, seven wins before that when it was in the in the league. Genefield are are firing. Obviously, we know that they they absolutely decimated Elgin City in the the Scottish Cup, so um, they'll they'll be on a high there. And Genefield have a really quality side. Let's let's face it, you know. Um, Socky have obviously made improvements. Uh, they've signed a few guys with higher league experience too, so they're they're looking to um. To really push now, but that, that's a disappointing result against Greenfield. But yeah, um, one thing we'll have to give a shout out to Doogie at, at Penny Cook for his fantastic uh, drone uh, view of uh, Scott Taylor McKenzie equaliser for for Penny Cook against you know uh, against Haddington. So um, fantastic, yeah, Doogie does a fantastic media job for Penny Cook. One of the best in the league, I would say. Uh, very in- innovative. Good to see Scotty T getting a you know a, a trademark left foot or ping I guess uh, whatever you want to call it but fantastic for, for Penny Cook they're, they're looking okay Penny Cook I think we talked they, they've had some troubles obviously um, since the start of the season with new, new management new team uh, but they're, they're, they're pulling off results here and there I'm not really expecting too much off them uh, Musselburgh's done well I think they beat Dunbar as well and Dunbar have been pretty decent so Moving on to the first division in the east of Scotland, it's Whitburn are sitting top on 27 points. Dunny Pace are on 25 and Camelin on 24 with St Andrews United and um, Newton Green Star on 24. Then a gap appears to Blackburn United in sixth. Uh, down at the bottom, it's Leith Athletic on 11 points, Oakley United on four and Vale of Leithen on zero. Um, unsurprisingly for Real League, and they seem to be um, wherever they are, they end up with zero points. Maybe, maybe their new name, Real League, and zero points. Nah, I'm joking. Uh, but yeah, looking at the top of the table, it's, it's very close up top, Chris. Um, what Burn Dunny pace yesterday, uh, a, a good game by all accounts. Yeah, Sam Colley got the goal for Dunny pace quite early on, and uh, from all reports, it, 
just ended in absolute chaos towards the end. Danny Pace leading. Um, I believe their physio was punched uh, allegedly from the match Whitburn ab- player. Match and- abandoned, yeah. The match abandoned. There was an injury to, I, I think it was Burn Keeper, not long after that, but it seems like it's all kicked off there between the... I've been to Whitburn, actually, many years ago, but it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's quite a old-fashioned sort of junior ground where Dunny Pace is, you know, one of my favourite grounds, I think, in East of Scotland. So it's um, two teams that are really uh, going at it in terms of challenging each other, and uh, I think it's just it's just over overflowing with whatever towards the end of the game there, I guess. And uh, But one thing I will say, I know I've been guilty of it myself, you know, the old Scottish football ha-ha-ha type thing, but I mean, come on, you, why are you hitting a fizzy way? Uh, yeah. Between players, it's, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say it's acceptable between players, but you can kind of understand that they're in the game together. But if that's, that's happened, it's, it's totally unacceptable. Um, just, it's not I'd, be, really I'd, great. I'd be interested to know more circumstances around it. I've not seen an awful lot of detail around it, but no. what, what has happened that did in the lead up to someone punching a physio? Like, that just seems like um, a mad state of affairs to, to happen, um, as you say, in any division or any any football match. But um, yeah, very, very odd. Um, but we'll keep an eye on maybe, maybe more detail up here. Um, I think, yeah, we'll we'll need to know what the result is there. I'm assuming because it's been abandoned in injury time. um, I'm guessing. It's probably stand, wasn't it? Yeah, I would would imagine so. And yeah, it's just look forward to the return leg, I guess, in that one. (laughs) Moving on to the second division, then just quickly uh, Bonus Athletics sit top with 30 points. Armadale Thistle sit on 26. Stirling Uni uh, Reserve sit on 24. And down at the bottom, it's Newborough on 7. Ormiston Primrose on six and Tweedmouth Rangers on three. Um, bonus Athletic not don't look like they're they're suffering for the losses of their their talented triple threat strike force from from last season. Ah, oh, they've they've just they keep plowing on. Uh, the biggest shock for me actually uh, in that league was how well Sterling Uni are doing. Um, we often talk about the the senior side. Well, I guess what we call the senior side in the loan. But I was uh, I was talking to Chris actually through DMs recently and. I said that to him. I'm like, I didn't realise how good the East of, the East of Scotland boys were, were, you know, were were going. And uh, they played Armadale yesterday, and uh, unfortunately, you know, for them, you know, they they lost three one. And but Armadale have made a lot of improvements recently. They've brought in a lot of sort of Premiership uh, East of Scotland type players. Obviously, Adam Uphill coming from Hill of Beef. Um, Aaron Ramage uh, is now Armadale, who was like a former Falkirk youth striker, and I believe. Uh, you know, Jack Jack Sears is on loan from Broxburn, so yeah, they're definitely looking to to try and push um, Bonus uh, for that league. But yeah, fair play to the uni boys. Uh, I did ask Chris. I was like, how how far do you think the East of Scotland team can get? Because how stressed would he be if he could, uh, you know, he was <laughs> he had a loan league team and an East of Scotland prem team if they they got back to back promotions or something like that. You know, it would have been mad. Even at the first division, I think it'd be a bit more difficult. Um, to where they are now in the second, so yeah, um, yeah, more more stress for Chris coming if uh, the boys can get promoted from the second division there. But <laughs> yeah, fair play to to uni. We we don't often mention them. We always focus on the lone league team. But yeah, great job. Um, unfortunate for the result yesterday, but Armadale are, you know, a contender and that like, very very strong. Yeah. Moving on then to the third division in East of Scotland, we'll cover that off just quickly. Bathgate Thistle are sitting top on 31, Hart Hill Royal on 25, Hoyt Royal Albert on 22, and down at the bottom is Linton Hotspur on uh, 3 and Livingston United on 2. Um, I'll be jumping here, I've got a few comments I can think I can make on, on this one. Firstly, Hart Hill Royal, a team that, that were in the West of Scotland for a, for a season uh, and switched back switched back to the East of Scotland, I think it was. I think they've been kind of yep. flip-flopping about in their back end. Sitting, obviously, saying the, in the promotion spots and, and in, in good uh, in good shape there. And went there on a, a pre-season friendly last se- uh, a couple of years back. And it was interesting ground, but certainly um, very welcoming and really enjoyed uh, the game up there. We played Hoyt, Royal Albert in the South Champs Cup last round. And I think absolutely... Uh, you could see they had quality. They, they look like they're well organised as, as a team by the by the management staff, and um, they obviously, in terms of difference in, in quality from ourselves to to Hoyt Royal Albert, 
you could see there was a diff- a gap, but you could also tell the quality they had in, in individually, and they looked like they were well set up. And and on the flip side to what I mentioned about Cowden Beath, they, they were very very nice, very friendly, and and um, a, a good bunch of committee and and players and staff and things like that that came along and um, attended the game. So. Yeah, got a lot of time for what how Royal Albert are doing, and I'll be keeping an eye on yeah. what, what they're up to over the course of the season. Yeah, Kenny Aitchison's done a, a fantastic job. A wee shout out to him. Uh, I noticed uh, BJ Coyer, the Harry of Watt manager, uh, tweeted out to him earlier saying, you know, we might keep up the good work, but I miss you, I miss you, basically, so I like, So, no, nah, Kenny's, uh, I got a lot of time for Kenny, and, and you know, well done. And one thing out. Probably a bit of an omen for for Monday, but Hart Hill obviously they had their badges a bit like Chelsea's and they beat London Hotspur, so I didn't really like that too much. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed Hart Hill's badges kind of similar to Chelsea's. And yeah, yeah. I, I do keep up with with London, obviously our favourite, our, our second favourite Hotspur That's side, that, uh, depending on the result on Monday, I guess. <laughs> hey, it's all right. Ange Balls, so Ange Balls going well, Chris. We're all, we're all happy, surely, as Spurs fans. We've got to be. You know, you know, it's weird actually. I, I don't know if I've mentioned this in the but I like, often talk about Spurs. We're both Spurs fans, but uh, I actually hate playing Chelsea. I mean, I'm more nervous for the Chelsea game than uh, than I am Arsenal because. Oh really? Well, Chelsea have a better record against us mostly, yeah, so I'm often more nervous. Uh, because I obviously I dislike Chelsea too. I used to go out with a girl that's a Chelsea fan, so I'm sure I'll need to give her abuse if we beat them. And she's <laughs> she's always had, you know, um, <laughs> what she's all. I think when we were going out, she always had one up over me eh, on that on that account. So um, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> Moving on then to the South Scotland uh, League, and it's just sitting top on twenty six, three down on twenty three. They'll be start on twenty two, and this still wanders on twenty one. And down at the bottom, uh, Upper Andale on, sorry, Wigtown Bladnock on four, Upper Andale on four, Loch Maven on four, and St Cuthbert's Wanderers on zero. Uh, Newton Stewart, probably, I would say, the surprise package at the top of the table at the moment, Chris, but it's very tight. Uh, Creetown and Derby Star got some games in hand, uh, certainly, but uh, Newton Stewart, top of the table, um, only lost once uh, so far this season. They're doing fantastically well. Um, I noticed that they congratulated Gretna on their win, obviously, uh, you know, football friends type stuff. Uh, football uh, one, friends. One thing we'll have to say, obviously, mention the uh, Dalbeat is Dean Watson, we, you know, on a, a very unfortunate sort of traffic collision. He was walking down the road um, and he's been hit by a, a, a car, I guess. And he's, I believe, from the report I read in the you know, BBC News or whatever it was, he's, he's, he's in critical but stable condition. So I really. Jeez. I'm really hoping, um, you know, he's he's going to pull through and, and be okay. Uh, thoughts are obviously with uh, everyone at Gretna. I know his current club, Dalbiti, being a former Gretna player and uh, Queen of the South. And it's a sad situation. There's a few instances since we've done this podcast that we've had to, you know, we've, we've had to deal with these sort of things. Not not so much in uh, Dean's, but you know, sad situations. I would I would say, and uh, that's certainly one. And I just hope that Dean pulls through because he's a fantastic young footballer. Whether he'll play again or what the situation is, I, 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 we don't know that uh, currently. Um, I think his health is more important than football. I think we've often said that, Ben. Um, I just hope that he pulls through from the current situation. And uh, yeah, very, very sad. Uh, sad note on the podcast, I guess. Uh, yes, a shame. I didn't realise he, he was still in a critical condition. So I would say, yeah, absolutely echo that uh, comment from Chris and hope he, he gets on okay. Uh, yeah, I think elsewhere in, in that division, it's probably no great shock that St Cuthbert's Wanderers are sitting at the bottom of the table. They have obviously struggled for a number of years. I think we had a, a kind of bit of a, a wonder season under Jordan Williams, and we've talked about Jordan plenty of times. We're still bringing up his name, but they were obviously in won the league and in the in the playoff a few seasons by, but just don't seem to be able to to get to get a grip on things. Um, the other thing you mentioned, um, I think in terms of South of Scotland, Mid Annandale, Chris. Um, Gary O'Hanlon, EK Thistle, um, yep. former manager, um, took up the the reins at Mid Annandale. Yeah, it's an interesting move, actually. Um, obviously, I think I wished Gary all the best at the time when he when it was announced that he took the job. I'm not actually sure how it how it works out if he's just sort of, you know, if he's he's just decided to he wants back in management again. Obviously, we know the, the issues with Isco, Isco Big Fissel. We mentioned him on the podcast. Hearsay and whatnot, we don't know the exact full story, but certainly um, 
you know, from what we heard and what we said, I think at the time, going by probably more so hearsay and obviously Gary's reaction was he was kind of pushed out of the club or I think the word was snaked out of the club, I guess. But um, yeah, it's good to see him back in management. It, it is a bit of a... I don't, I'm, I'm unsure on the move in terms of... Um, for Gary himself in terms of travel and, and whatnot, I, I'm not 100% sure where he's based. I'm guessing he's more West-based than this kind of, you know, Dumfries and Galloway. But uh, yeah, a very interesting move on. It'll be interesting to see the type of player he brings, whether it'll be kind of more local players or whether he's going to, you know, look at possibly the West, uh, you know, and uh, and bring in a few guys from the from the leagues there. But yeah, I, I'm unsure on that one uh, to begin with, to be honest. Yeah, I think, I mean, if he's probably, uh, if he has his school bike base, perhaps, I'm not too sure, but it's just a short journey down the bike, down the motorway, and it? it's not too oh, far. Oh, it's not very, way. it's not very far, no, okay, I didn't know. Uh, that, I don't think it's as, maybe as far if you're, if you're in that kind of Lanarkshire kind of region of, of the world, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I guess for, for, for Gary, it's, a, it's getting into a job, and perhaps mm. it's one of those ones, it's like a project where if you look at it and you can do well, you can either take my dad deal at the top of the the, the, the south and, and perhaps do some do something good and uh and then perhaps get back into a job in the in the prem because as you see the, the, you probably find that maybe his reputation perhaps tarnished a little bit from what what you know happened at East Coast I, I, I'm not too sure but um maybe that's why maybe he'd been trying to get into West Scotland clubs but there's obviously that the rumour mill can be like and um, people talk and all that kind of thing and um, it's good just to as you back. Was, just as you were talking there, Bear, I was remembering about all the carry on that went on with the Twitter and everything like that. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot, a lot of happened and when, when they broke up, you know, it was like a, uh, it was like scorned lovers almost at, um, when 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 Gary left. So there was maybe just a bit of kind of blowback from from that scenario that um, has meant he's not been able to get back in somewhere else in the west and. He's took an opportunity and, and, and best luck to him because yeah, I think um, it's a it's, it's a good it's an interesting one that we'll we'll keep in keep in top of and keep an eye on what's going on and um, certainly uh, in the south because we don't we don't see an awful lot of what happens in the south so uh, we'll we'll do our best to keep it keep tabs on on that front. Moving on to the one you've all been waiting for, the West Scotland Premier League, um, also the West Scotland Football League. Rather, I should say we'll cover off probably all the divisions um, as quickly as probably we can. Plenty to talk about um, at the moment in the the different divisions, but we'll start in the Premier League. It's Clyde Banks sitting top of the table on 26, Beath on 19 with four games in hand, uh, Paul on 18 with three games in hand, uh, Ben Bubb sitting fourth on 18, Davo on 17, Gart Cairn on 16, St Caddox on 15, Hurlford also in 15 alongside Largs, Cumberland are sitting in 10th on 12, Trunner on 11th, um, with 12 points also. Auckland Talbot are 12th uh, with 11 points. Arthley 13th with 11 points. Kirk and Tug, Rob Roy 14th with, with uh, 11 points. Glen Afton and uh, Arvin Meadow are 15th and 16th respectively with 8 points. Uh, we'll start there at the top of the table. Clyde Bank uh, sitting on top and they are in fine form at the moment. They had a good result yesterday against B, 1-3 now. B, obviously, I mentioned earlier, they're, they're a great side coming off a, a defeat to Broomhill. Uh, but it just shows you what it's taken to beat Beath. I think that's the thing. A good Clyde Bank side, a good Broomhill side to beat um, last year's champions. Uh, but yeah, Clyde Bank, Chris, uh, they look like a, a good side. And I think I side we talked about quite a lot at the start of the season. Yeah, uh, I believe there was a wee bit of needle going into that game. I think obviously they played e- e- uh, each other recently in the Cup and uh, I think Beath were winners on that day. And uh, I think there was maybe some overzealous beef players or whatever. I, I did read that somewhere, obviously. So Celebrating, um, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, remember that now. Over, uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, there was a wee bit of needle and, and Clyde, obviously. Uh, I think Lee Gallagher, it's a bit of a trademark for him now, isn't it? Scoring free kicks. Um, left peg, noticed. isn't it? Yeah, Lee left, peg, left so, peg, isn't it? Yeah, he opened, he opened the scoring, obviously, and Nicky, Nicky Lowe, who have... I don't think we've talked loads about uh, recently, but Nicky Lord's missus had a, a daughter on Thursday and he's, he's went up and scored against the, the league champions on Saturday. So um, congratulations to him and the family, obviously. Nicky's a top guy. So, But yeah, he scored an absolute peach in that game as well. 
Aaron Mason, I believe, got sent off towards the end of the game, I think the 70th minute or something for Beave. So Beave were completely out of that by then, you know, going down to 10 men. And I think Lee Gallagher's then, you know, hit the winner as well. So Clyde Bank, fantastic win against, uh, let's face it, a really good Beave junior side. Um, we've talked up Beave quite a lot. I've often thought that, you know, they're the best team in the West of Scotland. Uh, but Clyde Bank have shown up there and, and done fantastically well. Um yeah, there's one, you know, when we, we, I think when we talked about, I guess, the preview, I think there was three teams we mentioned, obviously, Beave, Clyde Bank and um, uh, Pollock, oh. I guess. And uh, yeah, um, there wasn't much separating Clyde Bank and, and Beave. For me, I think Beave just have a, a wee bit of extra, you know, considering obviously they were last year's champions, but uh, fantastic result for Clyde Bank and delighted for uh, for Moff, uh, Gordon Moffat, obviously the manager, and uh, some of the players there, obviously Thomas Collins and that, that we know. So, yeah, fantastic result, well done. Um, not, I'm not too concerned with Beaver. I think they'll bounce back fairly quick. It's just, it's just uh, a result coming back off. Um, as I say, I think it was a, there was probably a wee bit of a, a wee bit of needle to that game having come off the, the you know, the, the cup game as well, and, and Beaver obviously coming out on top of that one. So, yeah. Certainly, mentality can 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 change yeah, going into these games if you played other played each other recently. Yeah, I think the thing about Clyde Bank that stands out for me is that that depth and squad that they have now that, that they probably didn't have last season. You just look at their they're starting the lineup from from yesterday's game. Um, Kieran Hughes, James Grant, Ocean McHugh, Matt Niven, Jamie Darrock, uh, Lee Johnson. Lee Gallagher, Nicky Lowe, Thomas Collins, no slightly Nicky Little. Then you look at the bench, you've got Larry McMahon, Adam Hodge, Callum Graham, Connor Kelly, um, Liam McGonagall, all sitting on the bench to come on and affect the game. You know, absolutely got depth in, in the squad. And um I think that's the thing that the Clay Bank have. They've got like a front four of what Thomas Collins, uh, Nicky Little, Callum Graham. Connor, um, Connor Kelly, Ben the Kekins out on loan at the moment as well, a, a youth player who's who's pretty decent, uh, who can come back in. So, yeah, very good sign. I think like Clyde Bank will do well as long as he can keep that consistency up. But I think you're right about Bees. I don't think they'll be too concerned that it is a top of table clash against a big uh, or a or a rival and uh, and challenge for the title and, and a good side. So, but Bees are absolutely tremendous. Um, I think the thing that stands out for me is that uh, is Kieran Diver. Uh, it would be, I think, they, we talked a lot about losing uh, Josh Fowler and uh, whether or not he was going to, uh, if they could replace him, uh, Chris Jane brought in Kieran Diver at the, the start of the season. I think he scored 21 goals or something like that already uh, and we're only in November. Um, so, yeah, they've got the goal scorer that they need and they've always had the players that can create chances for, for a, a kind of box box to box or a box uh, penalty box striker so uh, and that's what Kieran Diver is I, I yeah. seen him last season against Ren, uh, for Renfrew in the, the Strathclyde Demolition Cup and I thought he looked excellent uh, would have loved to have seen him at Buffs Park at the time but um, yeah he's he's obviously keeping Beeves in pace by just scoring as many goals as he can just, I think it's important to know that he's he's a totally different striker to Josh Fowler yeah. you know what I mean and, and he still came into that that squad uh, that Beef squad and yeah, I mean he's a he's a big guy, obviously, as you mentioned. He's a he's a sort of you know penalty box player, poacher type type striker. But um, yeah, very. I, I've been really impressed with Kieran from what I've seen of him. But yeah, I think it is interesting that he's a very different to, yeah. to Josh Fowler. Um, yeah, good, really good for Beef. But yeah, as I say, that just one of the reasons that like you mentioned Ben that. I'm not really worried uh, for Beef going forward, as you said. They've got a lot of games in hand as well, so. Um, we we'll just keep an eye on it, I guess. One last, uh, well, we'll not go through the West of Scotland Premier League in mad detail, but one team we, we, we should talk about, uh, Chris Darville. It seems like there is, um, how do we call it? Some some going concerns at Darville <laughs> uh, in relation to, um, it seems, finances. There was a statement put out uh, last week uh, regarding the finances. We have seen... Um, a number of key players um, leave just this week. Ian McShane and Thomas Riley both leaving Darville. Um, I don't want to come across here like we're gloating and something. We're not here to do that. I mean, I'm obviously 
involved in, in a Western Scotland club, but it, it seems it seems like the money is drying up that we always talked about that allegedly wasn't there. Um, and Darvel, that was always what was talked about. The money thing wasn't really a th- wasn't really being spent and stuff like that on players, but from the statement it was put out, it certainly suggests that that's the case. Uh, they've got to make a lot of changes, and I think it looks like if they're selling guys like Ian McShane, Tom, um, Tom Thomas Riley, Riley um, Alan McKenzie went on loan to East Kilbride, Scott Ferguson's left um, to go to East Kilbride as well. Um, they're, they're selling a position. I've, I've heard rumours that, that Andy Leishman is probably going to go as well. Um, Max Talbot. Uh, that that's the rumor um, on the in the rumor mill. You know that's the, that's the suggestion back to Talbot, which makes up would make a lot of sense. Talbot crying out for a um, a quality a good quality keeper. I don't think they've got one at the moment. Uh, personally, from from what I've seen and, and getting Andy, he's he's loved at the club. I think he'll probably have a like a slight blemish on his name for for jumping ship to go to Darvel, but um, I wouldn't be shocked to be seeing him back there in the next couple of weeks. Certainly. Um, Massive concerns though for for Darvel, Chris. You'd think. Yeah, the statement that they put out, I I often like I've, I've not looked back on Berwick's one, but to me it was like a copy paste of yeah. what Berwick said about the Scottish Cup money. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's these clubs that are. I, I think it's really daft. You know, if you're relying on Scottish Cup money that you may may or may not get, I think that's very very. You know, it's a dangerous game, Darvel. We did wonder when Mick left if, if there was going to be changes there, financials. I think there was murmurs of, you know, um, uh, John Gall wanting to uh, to make the, the club more self-sustainable. Obviously, he's put a lot of money in. Um, it's one of those, Ben, that... Uh, we, we've, we say this all the time in t- terms of these, I guess, what we call money clubs and stuff like that. It doesn't last forever. Uh, and you're right, it, it's... This has not lasted forever for Darvel. They've had some really good. Uh, I think if you look back on it, them not getting promoted to the loan league, uh, that might have changed things in terms of investment because then they would have been closer to the SPFL, which is the majority of clubs. You know, financial avenues to to one of the reasons they want to go up is because obviously the money is a lot better and and whatnot. And uh, I think you look back on Trinent beating them in the playoff. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know if things would have been different if they did get promoted to the Lone League. Let's, let's put it that way. Uh, but certainly, I have. We've heard for a wee while that that the rains were coming in with, with what they were spending, especially after Mick leaving. I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always there's always been suggestions that, uh, and I'm going to go come out and say it. Allegedly, Mick was was supplying money into the club uh, through his. Uh, through sponsorship and, and things like that. I, I don't know if that's true. I don't know the ins and outs of Davil well enough, but that's always, the, again, go back to rumours and things like that that's been suggested. And and certainly the timing of Mick leaving and um, the, the statement coming out definitely seems like, it, to me, like it correlates. Um, I think you notice when, when Mick left and they were looking for a new manager and they looked around and, and there was names being rumoured that I think Gary Holt was mentioned, Jamie Hamill was mentioned as um, potential um, potential candidates for the job. Uh, and they ended up with Tony McAnally, who had been out of the game for a few years and um, had had some success as a manager, but probably quite an old school manager, not the um, not the big kind of name and uh, the the Davil project as they always used to referred to it as would have maybe wanted and we always I think again been been candid and very honest about things. There wasn't a lot of fans at Davil games. I think you got a lot of passing neutrals and a lot of um people turning out for the big games and, and things like that that they had, you know, the Scottish Cup matches and, and, and what have you, league winning matches, all, all that kind of stuff. But the the bread and butter hardcore support was probably in around a hundred and not I mean not a not a big support. If you look at other teams in the um the division, they're much better yeah. supported than, than that, you know, and, and, and that can't be sustainable for a club. Yeah, you can get sponsorship and, and, and things like that that will help the club, but you can't rely on somebody pumping money into the club to to go on a on a, on a run it. And the question probably is why why were they doing that? 
why were they getting involved at Darvel? John Gold uh, obviously is a very successful businessman uh, in Ayrshire and has, for whatever reason, wanted to get involved, but it seems like now that, that things are changing and they've got to kind of try and get a bit more, um, get a, bit of a better footing financially, and, and that's what they're doing. And, and I don't think you'll see the last of the, the moves. I think they've got a lot of players there that are, uh, that are probably on good money. And um mentioned Andy Leishman. You probably look at Craig Moore, David yeah. Syme, um just as some of the guys there that are, Quality players and probably again could walk into pretty much any club in the West of Scotland Premier League. Um, and if, if they can't afford to pay the wages that have been suggested, that again, everything's all rumour and conjecture a lot of the time. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see where Darvel will go. They, they could go into free fall. I think that would be my concern for Darvel is that they could just absolutely plummet down the table if, if all these top quality players do um, move on. Um, so, yeah, we'll keep an eye on, on the Davo thing. I think you see as well, I say, I'm not here to gloat. I think we're here to talk about football and, and, and have a, a conversation about what, what we think and what we expect to happen in different situations. And, yeah, I'm just not shocked to see this yeah. happen. Yeah. Am I shocked it's happened so soon? Absolutely. I think I thought this had a few more years to go in terms of Davo and, and what they were trying to do. But um, maybe it was only a three-year project and, the three-year project is coming to an end maybe this year, you know, uh, that's going to be where they're at, but yeah, it's a very developing situation, I think, at Darvo at the moment, um, which we'll, we'll keep an eye on. In terms of the football, just to quickly add that Darvo had an excellent result in the, the Scottish Junior Cup uh, yesterday as well, so I believe one of one of their goals broke the net or something, I heard, I think, the Booth, booth Giff or whatever was coming Oh, out. that's so, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic result for Darvo. After a, a week where you know, I think people have been a lot more critical than we have uh, been on Twitter. So, yeah, a massive relief in terms of the result there, I guess, in the in the cup. I guess one team that's um, benefiting from the the Darvel situation is Gart Cairn. Uh, they picked up um, the E. McShane and, and Thomas Riley. Um, probably thinking to myself, um, I hope it doesn't go like Darvel. They're, <laughs> they're spending a lot of money at the moment. It seems yep. they've, they've brought in a lot of players. Um, Again, don't know an awful lot about what's happened at Darvo. I, I, I know one of the owners. He's very passionate about Gart Cairn and what they're trying to do there. And uh, certainly interesting to see that they do they do spend money and, and go and get top quality players. Um, it's it's an interesting one. They're sitting six now, so they're actually doing all right. I, I didn't didn't realise they were as high up the table as they were. So uh, fair play to uh, to Gart Cairn. Uh, they'll. I'm sure continue to buy players and maybe perhaps maybe see more Darvel players um, arrive at uh, Gart Cairn in, in due, cor- due course. Perhaps they had a they had a quality team for when they were in the first division, and um, you know there was obviously I'm guessing money was spent for that team as well. But fantastic, obviously the the Thomas Riley sign and Thomas is a guy I know from Kelly, and he's he's a fantastic football, fantastic guy. I think you've often said that you you wish you. You had him at Kill winning, I guess. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's a good Kill winning man, and I'd love to see him playing for his hometown team. But maybe one day, uh, maybe one day, Thomas will fancy it. <laughs> Am I right in saying that uh, Mikey Dunlop's signed a new contract recently? I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well deserved, in my opinion. Obviously, have the success of getting promoted, and that, as you as you said, they're doing really well in the west of Scotland. Whether they can ever be a a top team. Um, certainly, if they make, <laughs> they make Ian McShane to, you know, <laughs> Thomas Riley yeah, type signings, they, they can be, yeah. Yeah, they're not going to have, I mean, I don't know how big their crowds are and stuff like that, but certainly if they're in a situation where they're, they're able to spend money and buy in players of that quality, then I don't think that'll be the last of it personally. Uh, and that's that'll be an interesting one to, to keep an eye on too. Awful, not an awful lot to talk about um, elsewhere in the Premier League, I guess, or can like Tal, but we talk to them quite a bit. Still sitting kind of um, near the bottom on 12th at the moment. Um, having a very, like we've always said, transition type season where they're struggling a little bit to, to get going. They'll be focusing on staying up now, I think. There was concerns from the Talbot fan base about maybe going getting relegated, perhaps. Um but I think they'll have enough in them to, to, to stay up. I don't think I'm too worried about uh, Auchinleck at the moment. 
No, I, I, we've, we've talked a lot about them. It's, you know, not even just this season, but last season. Um, can never discount them. Obviously, uh, I think this season I don't think they're going to win win much. I think it might be a you know a, a season where they possibly win nothing, which is very rare for Talbot. Yeah. But um, it's one to look out for uh, to see what happens there. But certainly, uh, we're talking about Andy Leishman possibly going back. He's always you know a Talbot legend. Going if they can get him back in. I think you're right about the goalkeepers. Obviously, the, the guys they have in, like they're they're on the younger side. Whereas yeah. I think uh, if you're playing, I think you need more experience. You need a, a keeper that, you know, Andy Leeson is a perfect example of a guy. That, you know, a leader. I think that's what they're missing actually. Um, a wee bit of leadership. I know they have some of the, you know, uh, some of the old, the old guards still there. Obviously, like say Craig McCracken and stuff like that. But if you look up further up the pitch, um. Uh, they have lost a lot of pieces, yeah. I would say. It's, it's a younger team for Talbot, which we're probably not used to seeing over the years. And um, I think they're all right. I think they're they're just a mid table team at the moment. Uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens and and you know the the seasons to come. But certainly they're just a a mid table team at the moment. But we never know. They could push. You know what a signing like Andy Leishman could I wouldn't say change their season as such, but certainly give them a a, a boost. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be a tall order if I mean, do anything spectacular. They're obviously out of a couple of cups already this season too, and there's probably not a lot left to play for um, in for Auckland Lake Talbot. I know the Talbot fans asked this will probably be gunning for his after yes. <laughs> comment, but like, I think I'm being pretty honest and pretty truthful uh, at the moment. Just quickly then at the bottom of the table, it's Kirk and Tuff, Rob Roy uh, on 14th, Glen Afton on 15th, and Irvin Meadow on 16th. I'll be as blunt as I can be here, I am not shocked to see those three teams at the bottom of the table. Um, did I think Rob Roy probably be a little bit higher? Yeah. Um, but Atherley um, are, are close by. And Auckland Lake Talbot uh, and Trin, um There's only, um, what is it, something like four points separating the seventh to <laughs> uh, 14th at the moment, you know, so there's plenty to play for, but uh, absolutely not surprised to see Glen Afton and Arthur Meadow at the bottom of the table. I just didn't. You played them, it, yeah, yeah. Didn't, didn't rate Arthur Meadow, um, having played them in a, a Eglinton Cup match um, at the start of the season. Didn't think they were any great shakes. They seem to have, they seem to be losing players in their droves um, at the moment. People. Uh, getting transfer listed and, and wanting to leave our meadow. I, I don't know what's going on down there. Glen Afton didn't rate them at all last season. Surprised um, from what I did see from them last season and um, haven't seen any improvements since Matt Roberts took over the reins. Matt Roberts was involved at the club um, as assistant manager at Ryan Stevenson before he left and it's not really changed at all. You know what I mean? It's just been the same old, same old and, and they're going to, I think, I think they'll be down at the bottom for, for the rest of the season, um, I'm sure. That was a shocker with Meda where Mark Waters obviously left, um, you know, vice captain or whatever the club, but he's kind of been a mainstay in at Meda for, for longer than mo- most of the other guys, I would say. So, I mean, to, to see him leave or have his contract mutually terminated or whatever, that that is a wee bit concerning for the Meda, I guess. Uh, Not just a vice captain, Kyle Fulms, the club captain, also requested to be transferred. Uh, transfer listed is also he's really there's, there's something going on there. There's obviously yeah. we don't know enough about it, but there's something um, that stands out for me uh, for sure. Moving on to the first division, then rather going sit top uh, on 23 points from Chapel on 22 points, Blantyre Victoria on 22 points uh, on in third, Shots Bonacord on 21 and fourth, and down the bottom uh, is Cobonnell side in 12th on 11, Canvas Lang on. 11 points in 13th Benfrew on 11 points on in 14th, Nielsen on 9 points in 15th and Whitley's on 3 points um, in 16th place um, it's an interesting one I think in the, the first division we're obviously sitting in 8th at the moment, um, we have despite getting beat of Cowden Beef I think 1 um, like 10 in the last 11 or something like that so our form now so um, the league's wide open, I think, in the in the first division, I would say at the moment. It could be probably any team from you know, look at it, maybe ninth up to top to first that can win that. I think we as a club we're kinda of really keen to just get promoted. I think that's the focus is get promoted, get back up. If we win the league, lovely, be exciting, be great for the fans and the players and everyone connected. But 
certainly we just want to get promoted back to the Premier Division. That's the, the main focus. I think looking at our teams, Roy Glenn, surprise package for me for the start of the season. I think it's surprised to see them sitting top of the table. I think um expect them to be playing mid table at the moment, but um from Chapel, good side, uh, some good players. And Blantyre, third seen Blantyre to be beaten four 0 I honestly shocked to see him sitting third on the table um at the moment. I think it's probably by virtue of playing more games, but certainly um an interesting one, Chris. Yeah, I think the I think what you all have to be worried about is your your pal Mr. Lafferty coming back for, for Johnson bro after after Christmas, I believe. So <laughs> Aye, we've been done there, right? So we've been absolutely done, right? <laughs> so we were meant to play Johnson Barrett uh, next Saturday in the league. Uh, and Johnson Barrett put a statement out saying that Kyle Lafferty had to go for surgery or something like that and therefore won't be able to play um, till, till, till after Christmas or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're looking at it going, all right, brilliant, Kyle Lafferty's not going to be playing. And then we find out that the Junior Cup setting round took place on Saturday, just passed, and that the third round takes place on um, next Saturday. So we'll try to catch the games up. So this nonsense rule that's in the West of Scotland Football League uh, constitution and rules and things like that, that that the Junior Cup can take precedence over a league over league games is absolutely farcical, right? I'm going to be absolutely brutal and honest because, and and if I t- if I get a, a hit for this as a, a club official making a comment about it, then I'll, I'll take the hit. And I'll pay the fine myself. Like absolutely no okay with that because. Um, I think it's a nonsense. I, I fully and firstly respect the Junior Cup um, and that the teams want to play in that. We, as a club, don't want to play in that. We're not interested in that for, for various reasons. Um, but I'm fine with a week being le- a week a weekend being left free for the Junior Cup and idle fixtures being put in to replace it. But I'm not okay with the two consecutive rounds in a row being played. Because um, there was potential yesterday that we might not have the game next Saturday because of the Junior Cup. Now, keep the keep the, the Junior Cup spot free, fine, but you can't have it two weeks in a row. So, um, we are now going to play Johnson Borough probably in January or something like that and Kyle Laffer will be back fit and he'll score a hat-trick. No, no my luck. Um, I honestly did not need, didn't know I was going to start something there. I just Yeah, you got it. me there. You got me, Chris. And I say, I'll absolutely, I'll absolutely take the hit if I've said something that's out of line. Um, and it's against the rules, I'll take the hit. But what I will say is, um, I will appeal it and I'll fight it to the death because um, West of Scotland uh, board members also make comments on social media um, and football forums, shall we say. And that, to me, contravenes one of the rules in the, the West of Scotland Football League. And if I've contravened a rule here, then we will absolutely fight fire with fire. I can assure you of that. Uh, but yeah, Chris, you've absolutely homed that a can of worms there. <laughs> Absolute classic grenade. But um, I just I just noticed the statement from obviously Johnson Brown at the time saying, you know, about Kyle Lattie, the same thing that you mentioned. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be interesting, but yeah, well, I think we'll leave that there um, yep. for the moment. <laughs> Looking at some of the other divisions just quickly across the, the board in the second division, the Drossel Winton Rovers are sitting top on 30. Cumberland uh, United are on 26 and uh, Vela Clyde on 22. Uh, at the bottom, it is Glasgow Persia on 11, Wishaw on 9 and Glasgow Uni on 6. Uh, I'm just going to say it right now, uh, Drossel Winton Rovers, I think I called it. Yeah, you did. You did. Um, I did notice something. Obviously, you mentioned another team on the, the other end of the uh, the spectrum there. Uh, Glasgow Uni not doing too well. Um, but I did notice, obviously, uh, Mark Adams, he tweeted something out that there's improvements there. But, um, you know, they're basically not going to throw in the towel and I wouldn't expect them to. Um, Mark Adams, not I'm from Penny Sterling Uni days, he was never that guy to be defeatist or, um, I guess, uh, pessimistic. So, yeah, good to see that. Um, they're, they're struggling a wee bit in that league, but uh, yeah, Ardrossan are a, a you know a really good side uh, from the top end. But yeah, looking at the bottom bottom end, um, not great for some teams, but not totally unexpected, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how. I don't know what we call. It. I don't know if we win bottom kind of further down the league. So who would be in the bottom? Yeah, yeah, I know we did for the prem. Um, Pretty sure I might have had Ben Burb in there, but they've been fantastic. So <laughs> moving on to the third division then, Bells Hill sit top on twenty six, Arrow Victoria on twenty one, Green Up Juniors on nineteen, uh Glasgow United on eighteen, and down the bottom it's West Park on nine, 
Port Glasgow on seven and Kell Rovers on sixteen. Um, I think surprise packs for me there. Bells Hill, Chris, I think um, have made massive improvements over the summer uh, and and are going great guns. Not lost a game this season. Yeah, I mean, I when I looked at initially at their team, I thought I thought they would do well, but certainly not top of the top of the league on the yeah. beating. Uh, that was that's crazy. But yeah, fair play to the guys there. Uh, I think when we look further down the divisions, it's harder to for for information, I guess, sometimes. And um, but yeah, Bell Hill are, are the, one of the clubs I think that we have on Twitter. Uh, sometimes they come up, sometimes they don't. Basically, um, yeah, this is why I have lists basically for all the all the different Absolutely. leagues because love them, love them. They're great. Yeah. They're useful. Hard to hard to keep track of otherwise, but certainly we try our best. But yeah, fantastic for these lads there. Um, in terms of the kind of near the bottom, I'm not sure I've, I would have expected, you know, uh, Kilo to be at the bottom. Like, nah, I, th- I think I think they've struggled over the last couple of years. Um, I think they struggle to attract players. I think that's their biggest right. problem right now. Where they're based, location wise, um, I think they stayed in the division just kind of by the skin of their teeth last season. They they brought in a few of actually some buffs under twenty players went and played there um, for the last uh, half a season. I remember. Like, Helped them um, stay up, you know, in a lot of ways. I think, but I think Sam North actually went to one of their games. I think last week, or week before, and did a video and kind of talked about how they're kind of struggling a wee bit. It's worth probably a watch if you want to uh, see more about Kello. Um, but yeah, not a lot to talk about in terms of when you as, as you go far down. Uh, and just briefly, we'll cover off the uh, fourth division. Uh, it's Glenville on thirty-one, St Peter's on twenty-five, Giffnock on twenty-four. Uh, and at the bottom is Royal Albert on seven, Easter House on six, and Salkins Victoria on three. Um, I think the one thing that stands out for me in uh, the the fourth division, Chris, is Glenville, St Peter's, Giffnock, uh, and then you could even argue Thorn and Knightswood and Rossville. They're all these kind of youth academy, um, youth academy clubs that are um, that are doing pretty well. They seem to have. Uh, got some decent quality players and, and getting results and, and, and doing well in, in their kind of first couple of seasons in the in the in the West Scotland uh, football league pyramid. So uh, that's the thing that, that I can I can stand. Out. I obviously keep a close eye on what Eglin are up to because they're obviously a co-winning team. They play at the same place as ourselves and, and kind of get a bit more exposure to the fourth division than I probably would the other um, divisions in in the, the West of Scotland. But um, in terms of the bottom, I'm surprised to see Carl Luke down there. I think they're sitting 13th at the moment, certainly. Uh, shocked to see that. But um, the one I'm not shocked about is Salkos Victoria. They are rotten. They are struggling big time. And have done for years. They're a club that haven't really changed and really struggled. And um, Again, Sam North has given him a very good plug this week. He's done a few videos <laughs> down at Salkos now. I think he's just about moved in his all coast, but the way, he, the way he's been, he's done like three games or something this season, uh, twice down at the actual um, Victoria Park and um, one on the road. So, yeah, they're struggling. They, they need wholesale changes at the club to kind of make a big difference. Um, but, yeah, that kind of pretty much rounds up the, the fourth division. Um, and the, uh, probably that probably rounds up the podcast. This is the return the episode. We will be back uh, next week, um, hopefully with everything around the pyramid. Uh, remember, get us on uh, Twitter at the official catch up. Get us on all your podcast um, platforms, uh, like, subscribe, do all that good stuff on YouTube too. Uh, it means the world to us. It doesn't cost you a penny and it makes our podcast look better and improves everything. Um, and we get a bigger reach and a bigger following. And that's all we want really from the podcast situation. But until next week, have a good one. Cheers. <laughs>